You are listening to the Found and Translation Talk Show, and you're listening to WPPMLP 106.5 in Philadelphia. Found and Translation stacks truth about politics and today's news headlines from a diverse perspective. This is your host, Ray Collazo. Let's say, como lo dice los dominicanas, alo. <laughs> to my co-host, speaker, author, and entrepreneur, Dionelli Reyes. Dionelli. Muchas gracias. We say alo. I thought we said que lo que. Alo. Alo. Maybe lo, la cibaeña say that. Que lo que, mi gente. Yo soy cibaeña también. Seguro que lo que, que mi sí. gente. Seguro que sí. How are you, Dionelli? How are I'm you? It's been too long. So happy to be a part of today's historic episode. Remember, familia, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, or anywhere you can download a podcast on the Ray's Latino Talk podcast feed. This is a historic day for sure. Uh, we want to not only discuss our analysis of what has happened on the island of Puerto Rico, truly a historic moment uh, for all of our communities. We're going to talk about that in a moment mm -hmm. and help connect the dots between what's happening on the island with some of the issues our very special guest is an expert on as it relates to mass incarceration, mass incarceration, whether it's an African-American in Philadelphia or a Guatemalan immigrant on the southern border. This is about criminalizing our community. Mm -hmm. And we want to connect the dots for our people today, because obviously some people would say, oh, it should be you, Vanessa, Monica and all these Puerto Ricans that come on the show to talk about Puerto Rico. But I want our especially our I want our Puerto Ricans and our non Puerto Ricans today to understand the connection with all of these issues. Uh, that we're connected to, and we have a very special guest who's going to help us with that. Uh, let's welcome the government relations strategist for the Reform Alliance, Kyle Darby. Kyle, welcome to Founding Translation. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. So I think, Kyle, we connected with your Latino twin, Andre Del Valle. We did. Yeah. Hey, can we talk about that for a second? Absolutely, so, we can. So I met Ray 2016 on a balcony in God knows knows what hotel in Philadelphia. It was at the Kimmel. We were balling. At the Kimmel Center. We it was. It was my party. It was your party. Oh, no question. It was what? at the DNC. This was at the DNC. I threw better parties than 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 uh Rosario Dawson did at the DNC. Are you kidding? These are facts. Um shoot, probably what, three years ago now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Three years ago now. Yeah. I mean It's a good yeah. time. <laughs> it's good networking good and i identified and in similar to andre much respect who yeah. just got an award i think for his work with the my guy with the local really hard with the local the party of good guy and of course works with the councilwoman yeah. um and uh i you know and we all connected right away like-minded especially mm -hmm. young men of color that are trying to i will always like to try to mentor uh, this generation mm -hmm. and you've been real helpful for me getting me workers and and we've been helpful with each other so i'm really glad it's overdue kyle to have you on oh, the show for this man. conversation definitely so later on in the show, we will learn more about what the Reform Alliance is doing to address mass incarceration and stack some 20s for next week's debates and my own gaslighting or no segment. But first, we have to address the breaking news of La Isla del Encanto. Late last night, Governor Ricardo Rosselló finally resigned in disgrace Wee, after leaked wepa. chats. Sí, ya tú sabes. And revealed countless examples of disrespectful and possible criminal behavior. This was the last straw for the island after the mishandling of Hurricane Maria relief by both the federal and Commonwealth governments and decades of local corruption spurred by colonialism. Ray, what are your emotions and analysis of this historic moment for your people? Oh, thank you, Dianelli, for being a part of this conversation. You know, first of all, it's been a blessing not only being Puerto Rican at this moment, but to be a Puerto Rican that has a lot of Puerto Rican friends on Facebook because we are, we are sharing in this moment together, and that's one of the beauties of social media, right? When mm -hmm. it's right, it's a real way to bring people together. And in our case, throughout the diaspora, right, we talk about the black diaspora. We talk about, in this case, the Puerto Rican diaspora, not only the island, but two-thirds of us are living somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so, especially for us that have that FOMO that we weren't physically there and not living the experience on the island, it's been uh, a great source of pride. Because the, you've seen the frustration of this island that has Absolutely. produced some of the most impactful people, particularly in the artistic world, in the world. I mean, think about... I mean, it was five or six, I mean, major global celebrities on that little truck the other day. If you just think about adding it up, right? But the my point is that it's it's there's with all this collective talent, there's a collective frustration of having a lack of self determination for the island, particularly this young generation. And then in the diaspora, places like North Philly and Camden, and I'm thinking about these communities in this area, is that we've always felt that frustration that we were first of all sort of demonized, stigmatized. Oh, that's a bad neighborhood. Those are poor people. Those are people who can't get their stuff together. Then we internalize it. And then for us to see that we created this movement that in two weeks, 
without one, not even, not even, not only one death, not even one major injury. I mean, it could have been an accident anywhere mm-hmm. when all this, all these people just bouncing around. Right. Yep. A bloodless revolution. So a great source of pride. And it really is a, it's a confirmation, an affirmation. Because look, and Kyle, you know this. There's a lot of times when doing this work can be really lonely because you feel like you're the optimist and everyone's Got like, that. been there, done that. Ain't going <laughs> to happen. They're another busy with all the things. Another young person that it. thinks they're going to mm-hmm. change the world. Ha, ha, ha. Mm-hmm. And particularly for Puerto Ricans and Latinos in this part of the country, even more so. Like, oh, what, what are they going to do? These people going to be in the basura forever and then our own people think that. Mm. So I think it's it's an affirmation that we can do great things Absolutely. when we work together. You know, Kyle, I wanted to ask you, obviously as a, a great friend to the Puerto Rican Latino community, but as a social justice advocate, what has the last two weeks, I know you were observing what's going on on the island closely, yeah. what has it taught you? What lessons do you think you've learned about the movement you're involved in? I mean, there is a ton going on right now just in the stratosphere of, of politics and, and the world and, you know, not just here in the U.S. and and on the island, but globally, um, you know, shout out to Meek. He just got off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has a new trial. Yes. Um, you know, ASAP Rocky is is locked up as we speak in Sweden. Um, you know, obviously the last couple of weeks in PR has been amazing in so many different levels. And you mentioned bloodless revo- revolution. I mean, that doesn't happen anymore. And the fact that it happened yeah. and kind of we got a new example of that and. You know, it, it just brings me to, you know, what's important in, in politics and, and just interacting with other people, Absolutely. which is the people on the ground and, and the people that are um, involved in these communities. I want to get you. We'll get your take on ASAP, the Rocky situation later. That was actually we reached out to our audience and say, what questions do you have for Kyle? And that's the one that kept popping yeah, yeah, up. So yeah. we'll, get, we'll get to that <laughs> later in the show. But I, I would say and I'd like to get you and Dionelli's thoughts about this, because one of the things my I did sort of an impromptu podcast earlier in the week when things were getting hot. Uh, just on my own. And one of the things that I commented on and I've been reflecting on a lot is that I think what Puerto Rico should teach all of us here that are doing work in the United States, particularly sort of in this minute during this era um, that we're going through, is that you have to match the leadership and the act and the action with the with the moment at hand. Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the things that we're all many of us are frustrated by, just thinking about it in this political context, and you know, and we'll talk about Mueller later and this impeachment, it's like that the Democrats and a lot of people sort of in the political class are treating this time like as if it's like a normal political time. And it's mm-hmm. not. So this is, listen, it's not. If, if everything that has happened in the last, you know, six months, let alone the last two years, is an indicative of a change in, in the way American life is handled, then we're just sleep. I mean, you know, this is, this is, this is a time of mobilization. This is a time of inter, you know, connectivity in terms of social media. Um, you know, the whole gambit of the way we communicate as human beings is just on a different level now. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, Kyle, because obviously it's not like we're not doing anything, right? I mean, there's been a lot of flare-ups, right? So like the Muslim ban, there was a lot of activity Mm -hmm. around the airports. We've had, I mean, even before Trump, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement has has brought criminal justice to a whole other level of understanding Mm -hmm. in this country. We have President Sanders talking about it. We'll talk about that a little bit, too. Um, so we're, it's not that we're not being mobilized. I mean, the Democrats flipped the House in 18, so we did some electoral mm-hmm. successes. But it just don't feel like enough. And and I think a lot of us, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this too, Dean Ellie, because I know you're very passionate about these issues, is mm-hmm. that I think a lot of us are thinking, how come it's not enough? And why don't we get more people doing this? And I've seen on social media my, my immigrant Latino friends talking about, man, how come we're not doing more like what the Puerto Ricans are doing, or they're not doing that in Venezuela, or we're not doing that in the black community here? Like, why aren't we standing up more? So why don't we start with you, Dinelli? To think about it. so, Dinelli, what are you feeling that though? Do you think people are feeling that way? And then how do we then how, how do we respond to take these actions that we need to do to protect ourselves to another level? Because we're literally under attack right now. Yeah. Yes. So how long uh, were Puerto Ricans and um, other people protesting the whole Jose Joe situation about, about, two about weeks? Yes. So the reason I believe that it was effective is because they had a goal. They're like, we want you to resign. This is what we want you to do. And I feel like the reason why in the United States there's so many issues that 
aren't being, ad- well, they're being addressed, but there isn't a lot of change how we would like it to see. It's because right. there's so many different issues. Mm. So it's like we want we want this to happen. Right. We want equal pay, equal mm-hmm. work. We want more immigrant rights. We want uh, justice reform. It's like so many different things. And it's like if you're going to a protest, which one do you go to? Right. So right. it's kind of like, okay, guys, <laughs> you know, this day really we're going to do point. this. Yeah. Let's all We all got to galvanize and come together. And also we need to stop thinking that, oh, Latinos are one group, black people are a different group. Mm-hmm. Um, that's their issue. That's their issue. It's yeah, like white women have their issues. No. Other progressives have their the environmental so, kids have their issues. Yeah. That reminds me of um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote: uh, "No one is free until we are all free. Facts until we're all free facts. from oppression and injustice." So I think we all need to come together. Maybe we need to like and, schedule and like Jesus Monday's quote: "Love your neighbor." Exactly. Yeah. Real complicated exactly. stuff. <laughs> yeah. So that's a good point, Kyle. So how do we how do we help? So do we bring all these issues together to try to identify? One or two specific things we can work on. Do we just support each other's movements think, to identify something more tangible? Is it? So, Dianelli's brought up a really good yeah, point. Yeah, she, she brought up the most important point in our political climate right now is that everything's in a funnel. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, a well, myriad Trump's of chaos strategy. Yeah, it's I like mean, if there's, I break everything. It's harder to deal with right. one thing. Mm-hmm. If there's, I mean, there's a myriad of issues that are going on right now, and you just named a few. Mm-hmm. And the issue with all of them, I mean, we all eat the same, we all go to sleep the same. We all need to have jobs. Yeah, bleed red. Mm-hmm. It's it's simplistic stuff. We're all human beings, and, and a lot of these issues, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's it's you know any sort of reform, a lot of these issues not they're not being handled in a in a humanistic perspective. It's being handled in kind of a you know it, like I said, it's a funnel. You got you got folks that are galvanizing for these different issues, but mm-hmm. not coming together as a as a community and saying you know we have more alike than you know than we do in difference. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I feel like a lot of times we focus too much on the problem. Right. Like, it's good to recognize it, but then it's like, okay, let's focus on a solution now. Let's mm-hmm. come together for a solution. Yeah. This is what needs to get done. I, I always say done. that to uh, some, of my, some of my political friends and, you know, a lot of the panel discussions that, you know, folks have in these events where, you know, these these experts on stage and there's an issue posed and we talk about the problem for two hours and then the last 10 <laughs> minutes yeah. of the event, we'll talk about possible solutions. Mm-hmm. You know, it needs to be flipped. You, yep. you you brought up a good point, Kyle, because I think another another lesson that's come out of this revolution in Puerto Rico is that, you know, the the issue on some level is pretty fundamental. It's like we need government working for us. Right. Mm-hmm. We need ethics and we need respect. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, one could argue, well, you know, okay, he said some they said some rude things in a private chat, but it's like, is that to was it for all that? And obviously that's it's more than that. But my point is that I think it re- really triggered people because it was about like people's simple self respect. And then mm-hmm. but then they reacted to it authentically yes whereas here we're all trying to strategize how to like convince you know several uh, tens of thousands of of moderate white people how to vote a certain way and we're mm-hmm. so scared about well how are the people going to react and, and we just don't have we're not we're not we're not feeling enough confidence to just live our truth because the reality is if mm-hmm. we're really for real for all about this we'd all be surrounding one of these camps in texas every day until it got done mm-hmm. and why are we doing that and i'm including myself there's power in numbers yep. there's always been power in numbers uh the million man march for example, how much how much of that galvanized support for the civil rights movement? That's right. Um, I mean, I can name a ton of, of different movements. I mean, the Muslim ban, we ended in a weekend in because a week. of how we dealt with the airport. Because, yeah, I mean, there was, what, millions of people you at the fo- airport. They were focused on that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, listen, we're, we're in such an interesting time, and, and you mentioned the governor. I mean, you know, malfeasance in any, any which way is just completely inappropriate. And by malfeasance for some of the viewers, um, it's just complete disregard for ethics and morality and and those sorts of things in a public space. And what the governor did with that chat with with some prominent members of of his administration, Casey, yeah, his, his I cabinet mean, essentially. It, it, all the all the non-females, yeah. all the guys. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's not a small thing. It's yeah. something that it's an American fabric though. It's not just on the island. It's That's not right. just in the Oval Office. It, it's reverberating across the country and the reason being is because we're allowing it. We're allowing it. That's and right. there's not a chat for every you know public official that does those sorts of things. But there's, you know, uh, there's examples for folks that, you know, are involved in the Me Too movement that might be an elected official or have said something publicly like our president has said multiple times. Mm-hmm. That's just completely inappropriate. And we need to set a standard. I mean, right. we, we need to not allow folks to just say whatever they want in positions of power because it, it has a, a substantial negative impact on our communities. And you got kids. I mean, the youth are the most important part of our community, and and I'm just concerned what what they think about this, and and how they're going to 
uh, describe this in 10 years, what we're, what we're going through right now. Well, and, then, and people don't realize, you know, there's kids going to elementary school. You know, it permeates the society. Leadership matters, right? So, like, you know, I mean, and you hear this, you know, you hear reports, but we know every day, think of all the Latino kids, especially in these mm-hmm. mixed areas around the country that are getting teased, getting bullied. You never hear about them in the news. And this is impacting whether the, whatever their citizenship status is. Yeah. And this is impacting the way they're growing up their whole life. And then I think about on the flip side, these Trump rallies, Mm -hmm. and you'll see like the random little white kid, like eight years old with a MAGA hat, yelling and screaming and looking around. It's like, what are they teaching? Right. Can we, can we call it hate? Absolutely. And like, can we, can we just call it that? But let's get a little bit deeper though. Yes. It's lack of education. Yes. Yeah. It's complete lack of education. It's lack of education. Because on some level, they're the one they're getting played almost as much as we are. The difference is we're, we're under threat. When, Mm -hmm. when you're not learned, in a way where you're understanding the history of every person that you're interacting with, um, what what happens is you hear things like "Go back to where you came from," mm. and it sounds good. So yeah. You're like, "Yeah, I want to be. I want to. I want to be the only person in this space." Yeah. It, it, everything that we're going through right now, in my opinion, is is very simplistic. It's it's not that difficult to understand, and, and mm-hmm. it's it's severe lack of education, and we need to get back to that. As Ignorance a is the enemy. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. right. The, the last thing before we get into the next segment, we're going to take a deeper dive. And we're here with Kyle Darby from the Reform Alliance and uh, my uh, very special guest host this week, Dionelli. Today has been too long, Dionelli. It's <laughs> great to have you back but the mm-hmm. um, on Founding Translation. But I think I'd like to hear a few words about where we go from here. Dionelli, you're the one that said it really well. Like the Puerto Rican community had a goal. It was very specific. Mm-hmm. We were to mobilize around it. There was a clear target and it got accomplished. But now what do we do? And so um, thinking about other movements and things that we've seen where that's then it's like, okay, we won this victory. How do we build on the momentum? So what would be, what's your thoughts, Diana, to like keep doing what they're doing? Like now it kind of gets harder, right? Cause we have, there's a political reality next year's the elections and how does the party structure in Puerto mm-hmm. Rico? And then some people don't want the next person to be the governor. So um, that's going to be the hard part. I think it's mm-hmm. kind of figuring out what's, how do we organize on the next step? I think using social media will be really helpful. And I think, just seeing how powerful we really are when we come together and the Puerto Rican protesting and hashtag eh, Ricky Renuncia, like that really, really worked. It brought people That's together right. and it happened. So y- seeing things like that and understanding, like, look, it really can happen when yeah. we come together. And I think keeping it inclusive. I mean, the fact that, I mean, eventually there's going to be some political dynamics coming to play on the island, mm-hmm. but the fact that it was intergenerational. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's another lesson, I think, particularly for. Latinos and African Americans in, in this country, because oftentimes, and I work with Latino leaders all over the place, and they, and they always, they always, uh, so many, too many of our leaders and community people think that the problem with the Latino piece is that there isn't like this charismatic leader. There's no Latino Obama. There's no Latino I'm okay. There's no Latino Jesse. J- I mean, there they always are, take no, but, but, but there's only stand one behind Obama. them. But but oh. the, <laughs> right. but, but to that, that point, point. that point, but to that point, this was a faceless movement. Listen. Call, when 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 there's when there's people frustrated about a particular thing, in order for it to be successful, there needs to be a call to action. Mm-hmm. And a lot of our movements are rah rah, shouting. This is wrong. This is wrong. Yeah. And unfortunately, what happens is, if you don't have any call to action. Nothing gets done. Yep. It's a lot of chatting and talking, but it's no action. And that d- not only takes uh, emotion. But it also takes strategy yeah. and, and a campaign plan. So uh, get us to the outro, Dianelli, and we'll come back momentarily. Okay, when we come back from break, we're going to learn more about Kyle Darby and the Reform Alliance movement. You're listening to the Found in Translation talk show. All right, we're back. Do your thing, girl. <laughs> You're listening to the Found in Translation talk show on WPPM LP 106.5 FM in Philadelphia. Listen to 106.5 FM in Philly at phillycam.org slash listen and on the TuneIn app. And you can download podcasts on Raise Latino Talk podcast feed on iTunes and anywhere you can download a podcast. I want to give a shout out to our people watching on Facebook Live, IG Live. You may be watching, you may be one of Dionelli's. You know, her, her D-Tribe, she got the D- Did Inspire D-tribe. movement. <laughs> Kyle Darby, got a lot of friends out there. Uh, uh, your partner's helping us in the back. Jen, right? Thank you so much. You've been so helpful this evening. Thank and, you. of course, all the Founder Translation family uh, watching us. We're having a great conversation here about 
really kicking it off again. So proud of my Puerto Rican people for the movement we've had. Mm -hmm. But this is bigger than Puerto Rico. This is bigger than Puerto Ricans. How do we build a movement to combat, uh, really build the, 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 the country and world that we want? And we've got some great people, uh, the Onelli and Kyle, to talk about that. Kyle, let's get into, let's let's share with people this gift of Kyle Darby with our Founded Translation oh, man, community. You know, before you started working, focusing on criminal justice exclusively with the Reform Alliance, you were already very involved in community activism. So why don't you share with us how, Kyle, uh, you got involved in uh, social justice movements? Yeah, man. It, listen, my my political trajectory has been completely surprising to myself. <laughs> my entire family, they continue to ask me what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> But, I, you know, I started in, in Cory Booker, Cory Booker's office, and prior to that, I, I started uh, knocking on doors. I was really um, involved in the Democratic Party in New Jersey, in southern New Jersey, um, started knocking on doors, and I got an internship with Senator Cory Booker and, you know, worked with his folks in, uh, in, in New Jersey uh, for quite some time and, and uh, also built the College of Democrats of America during my, my time in uh, Rowan University as well as Stockton University. Um, so, you know, developed a ton of relationships with the Democratic Party uh, nationally. Um, and kind of segued myself back to Philly. My family's from West Philly, um, so I, I definitely had to come back home. I, you know, got my master's in, at uh, Temple University, mm -hmm. um, and, and really, you know, just being back in the community. It's different in Jersey. Jersey, you gotta, you know, walk down the road ten minutes to get to somebody's house, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but no, it's 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 good to be in the city. And you know, I've been a lobbyist for a few years. Um, in the city working for uh, Wojak Government Relations um, as well as Bellevue Strategies. Um, and, and ironically enough, when I was at Bellevue Strategies, uh, most recently we actually helped put on the first two Meek Mill rallies. Uh, mm -hmm. When he first violated his, uh, his probation and was sent back, um, we did the, the first two rallies for him in tandem with a few other organizations. So, um, you know, I got looped into the, the Meek apparatus and the Rock yeah. Nation apparatus through that. And, um, you know, really it's just, it's been a blessing, man. It's, it's, you know, to be in a in a space where you can be very concerted and very deliberate about how you change, you know, people's lives and, and be very um, serious about changing people's lives and, and helping, you know, our neighbors and our and our folks um, that, that we care about, that we say we care about, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a blessing for me. Mm -hmm. So what about Reform Alliance? Uh, is what is Reform Alliance doing in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania to raise awareness and change the criminal sure. justice system? So Reform Alliance is the most just impactful organization I've ever been a part of. Uh, Van Jones is our CEO um, in tandem with Jay-Z and Meek Mill and Robert Kraft of the Patriots and Claire Wu Tsai, uh, Michael Novogratz, um, I mean, Michael Rubin. Um, I know the, those names are now. And they're just some people on Facebook. Like, oh, he works with them. Yeah. Okay, mm. yes. Van, yeah, yeah. Van that light bulbs, reform, that <laughs> light bulbs, caps, yes. caps, caps yes. Rock yeah. Nation. Van reform. likes to call them Meeks, the Avengers. Meeks political guy, <laughs> right here. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, you know, this this organization is incredible. It's it's a uh, criminal justice reform organization, uh, really focused on probation and parole at this at this particular juncture, and um, in, in uh, Pennsylvania in particular. Pennsylvania, most folks don't know. Um, is one of the worst states in terms of incarceration. You know, I learned yeah. that from you, Kyle, because I didn't realize. I mean, I knew criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, and one of the things that I wanted to highlight in this episode was that it's obviously the issue is is, is so historically acute with the black community and black yeah. males particularly, but it is a major issue in the Latino community, and I didn't realize that it was even disproportionately effed up in Pennsylvania. Can you explain that? Because I didn't even realize. I mean, in urban America, I know it's an issue, but... We have a real problem with, um, with with people just kind of continuing the cycle because For small of small infractions, yeah, yeah and probation. Listen, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania spends two hundred and fifty million dollars a year <gasps> on community supervision. In other words, probation and parole. They also have upwards of three hundred thousand people on probation and parole. It's almost a million dollars a person. Oh my goodness! And the conditions that folks are on are completely just erroneous and, and just doesn't make sense. I mean, the fact that me popped a willy in New York, you know, and, and got violated. They re they arrested him the next day. I mean, it, it's just insane. I mean, if you if you go to a meeting with your probation or parole officer late, if you associate with somebody with a criminal activity, you know, that has criminal past and has done criminal activity, um, I mean, and the then how could you not if you're living North Philly and like where there's and then you got to check rate. in, you know, every so often. What happens if you have a job? Do you go to do you go to your job or mm -hmm. do you, you go to your probation or parole officer? 
Yeah. Or if you have to visit your family member. And if you don't go, you might go to jail. Mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody. They were telling me that their cousin, I saw Latino, said their cousin, I guess, had the ankle bracelet, but they were charging it. Mm. And so the kid, their kid ran by and knocked it off, like knocked off the the charger. Mm. So it went offline for a second. Yep. And they came and brought him in. And it was like, oh my it's goodness. so unreasonable. And by the way, those bracelets, they got to pay for those. Are you kidding me? If you're on probation and parole and you have, and you have an ankle bracelet, you got to pay for it. Wow. So I mean, listen, this it Pennsylvania is 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 rough. Um, it it needs fixing. Um, there's you know a ton of organizations on the ground that you know preceded me and preceded this organization. Um, there's a ton of activists that have been doing this work on an individual level uh, for quite some time now. And you know the the movements here. You know, and, and Pennsylvania is has been a leader in in the country for you know generations and, and centuries now. And obviously the the country's uh, you know, was was birthed in Philadelphia. So, you know, of course, this this city has a, a near dear place in my heart as well as other people's hearts. And I think, you know, our strategy is if it starts here, it can be it can be replicated across the country. So, Kyle, what so right now in terms of the issues you're addressing, because I know you've done some work in Harrisburg. So right now is the focus of Reform Alliance to deal with what's going on in Philly and throughout the state. Is it state legislation you're looking for? Is it local policy? What what are sort of the it's, goals for Reform Alliance in, in Pennsylvania? It's right state le- it's state legislation. I mean, okay. you know, each state, obviously, because we have the beautiful Constitution, is able to do whatever they want to do, you know, and, and states' rights are obviously important to some, to some, you know, to some degree. And I think, um, you know, state legislation is, has the most impact on the local level. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's our strategy. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. And then what, what is a Reform Alliance doing? I think a lot of people... Are understand what reforms doing like basically following Meek on social media a lot of times yeah. or maybe Jay or Rock Nation or just sort of part of that ecosystem. No, it's just it's just making it's making the issues at hand mainstream. Mm-hmm. It's using the platform and the people that you know we we have working with us um, for good and using that their network in a way where we can get the message out um, in a way that hasn't been done before. And that's really fundamental, right? Because it's my understanding that part of how this started was. I think it was the six row owner, Michael Rubin, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that him and a few other people just who, who knew me friendly and were fans, mm-hmm. they didn't understand, they didn't realize that these dynamics happened where people could go get incarcerated for yeah. really nothing. Most, most people don't know, though. Yeah, yeah. me kept telling um, Rubin, like, listen, I might get locked up. I'm a, a man of color. And he's mm-hmm. like, nah, that's impossible. How do you get locked up over that? And then he went and he got locked up. And then me called him and it's like, see, I told you. Mm-hmm. And that's where he's like, oh, wow, there has to be change. Yeah, I mean, listen, we, th- this this country, it, and it's not just in Pennsylvania, it's it's not just Reform Alliance and what, and what we're working on and not just other organizations. Like, this this country is historically known for incarcerating people and, and, you know, locking them away and throwing away the key. And we're trying to change that dynamic and change the culture around it and change the understanding around it, really, because people just don't know. I wonder if that will change the loophole in the 13th Amendment. Can't, you know, the <laughs> that, that. Why don't you explain that to people? Okay. <laughs> Gianelli always schools me when she. No, you hit you hit me from left field. So I was like, yep. So the Thirteenth <laughs> Amendment. You guys remember the Emancipation Proclamation? Mm-hmm. Oh, now all slaves are free. You can't have slaves. Well, the Thirteenth Amendment formally abolished slavery in December 1865. Mm-hmm. So yay, great! The United States is awesome. But there's a loophole. So it says, neither slavery nor involuntary involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. So if you're in jail, then you could be a slave. All right. <laughs> so that's, that's I was why, waiting for it. Hello. <laughs> yeah. That's why. It's like, no, we need people. We need people. Yeah. So now they, they replaced, replaced slavery with incarceration. Mm-hmm. And that's led to our sort of, because as a country, we approach imprisonment and incarceration as like punishment. We don't really see it as really. But it's a, two, it's a a twofer, lot. though. It's it's it, it leads to lack lack of public safety in the community because if if I feel like I'm going to get locked up, regardless of of anything that I'm yeah. doing, whether I got a good job, whether I got a good family, mm-hmm. because of my color or yeah. what you think, if it's inevitable perceived, anyway, yeah, it it messes with your psyche. And you start doing stupid things, mm-hmm. and you will like go I'm to going jail. to jail anyway. My then, uncle's going to the jail. And then my there's dad, another yeah. piece uh, in terms of the impact on on the back end of things with the economic development, economic opportunity in our communities, especially communities of color, mm-hmm. where we don't have the same access as white folks. Mm-hmm. We don't have the same opportunities as white folks, and that puts us in a position where it's 
It's do or die. We got to fight for what we get, you know? That's right. Kyle, when we come back, we want to continue the conversation about Reform Alliance and then get into some of the news headlines this week. Dinelli, take us out. Let people know where they're listening to right now. So you're listening to Found in Translation. And when we come back, we're going to listen more to Kyle Darby and listen to some more information about the Reform Act. You're listening to Found in Translation Talk Show on WPPM LP 106.5 in Philadelphia. We are celebrating this historic moment for Puerto Rico and talking with Kyle Darby of Reform Alliance about how we use lessons of Puerto Rico to organize for criminal justice reform. Kyle, how should people get involved in criminal justice reform issues and engage reform? Get educated about it. Realize. What's that website? Give us, <laughs> give us those hashtags, man. Give us the handles. We got to look at ReformAlliance.com. Uh, ReformAlliance.com slash Pennsylvania. Uh, my handle is at King Darb, at King, K-I-N-G underscore D-A-R-B. Um, and, and follow Reform Alliance on all social media at Reform. On our stacking 20 segment on the presidential elections, what we do every every week here, Kyle, we talk about the presidential elections and we stack 20s for our local uh, nonprofit organization, the Love Shouldn't Hurt Campaign, mm. which is a movement to support particularly our Latina domestic vi- uh, violence survivors, Christina Vega's organization. I want to remind people we have the debates next week. They're going to be in Detroit. So that should be an interesting setting. Kyle, several candidates have made proposals around criminal justice. And, you know, we, you know, you're here to represent reform, so we're not going to pin you on any particular candidates or anything. But as an organization and as Kyle Darby, what do you want to hear as it relates to criminal justice issues? What do you want to hear the candidates talking about? Tell them the truth about what they know. They mm-hmm. they know they know how this country treats folks. They know how you know how this country has incarcerated folks at an astronomical level more than any other country in the world mm-hmm. per capita. Um, just tell the truth about the issues and be very candid and honest about what they're going to do about it. One one thing that I, I really enjoyed because the incarceration piece is, is definitely tied to the policing aspect of things um and and pete Buttigieg said something really interesting on the stage the last go around you know they asked him well why didn't you fire the the police officers that were engaged in this misconduct and he said well because i couldn't get it done and he was very honest about it he was very forthright about that and we need more of that from our leaders and that's we're not getting that right now there's not any account of, you know there's no there's no accountability there needs to be account- accountability amongst our our leaders and we need to feel like they're human because mm-hmm. we make mistakes. But when we feel like our leaders, you know, just just perfect human being and, and can't make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they're not owning up to it. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, we have an issue. And I, I feel like, you know, Mayor Pete did that really well on the stage. Um, and one of the things I really enjoyed was was uh, Senator Senator Harris, um, you know, going after <laughs> going after Biden for something that was very serious. I mean, yeah. you know, these these issues, especially the criminal justice issues, have a lot of underlying um, underlying, you know, information and, and kind of knowledge embedded into them. Um, and the civil rights movement is, is honestly the perfect example of, of the undertones of the criminal justice system. And she highlighted that um, as well as anybody on the stage. Yeah, no, and, and it's interesting because it, you bring up sort of honesty, right? Because the honest truth of it is that, and, you know, I mean, the, 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 the federal government and the DOJ uh, doing things like having, you know, like holding police departments in big cities and Ferguson and Baltimore accountable. Yeah. But the federal government piece is only a piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And we know people like, we talk about this on the show, a lot of people like Sean King and other activists who have gotten involved um, in Philadelphia, sort of a, a touch point to it, right, around how do we get more progressive um, district attorneys in our, in our urban areas so that we can have, um, you know, so we can have uh, a different approach to policing. How do we... Uh, develop a different culture in our police forces, and that's really a mm-hmm. police force by police force. There's there's sensitivity training culture to that. There's hiring practices. We just saw in Philadelphia that I mean a disturbing amount of I mean several about thirteen cops got fired, but yep. there was dozens if not hundreds mm-hmm. that had some really disturbing Facebook posts. So this stuff they're wow. they're willing to reveal publicly. We've got a serious 
culture that we have to address. It's just it's it's sad because it's a simple fix. There, of course, there's a lot of racism. There's a lot you of think hate. It's simple though, Kyle. I mean, no, there's a lot of levels. I mean, there's a lot of levels. But to me, I'm a lover. So, like, mm -hmm. I, you know, in terms of my passion for other human beings, I don't care if you're white, green, yellow, purple. You must have worked for Booker. He was a love no, guy. He's I a mean, big love no, guy. I'm, I'm serious. Much respect, Corey. And, like, <laughs> and, like the, the, and especially the policing piece, you know, with those, those cops being fired, you know, the problem is they're not coming, you know, police officer or not, you know, when you're not from a, a particular community, you feel uncomfortable in it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And... We need more folks going into communities that they're not from and feeling uncomfortable and getting immersed in something different. Mm -hmm. And the the issue with, you know, racist police officers and, and folks that are engaged in that type of activity is that they don't know the communities that they're policing. They don't know, you know, who these families are that have been there for generations. Yeah. They don't know what the kids are like and what, what they go through on a daily basis living in a, a, a volatile environment. Um, and just understanding those things makes a, a hell of a difference. Um, and, and just really understanding who you're who you're there to protect and, and emphasis on the word protect. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we just need more more police officers. And I, listen, my father was in the Air Force for 25 years, so I'm not anti police. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, pro pro, you know, protesting against the police. But we need to have police officers um, there to serve and protect like they're sworn in to do, um, but also understand the, the human perspective. Um, and, and a lot of the human perspective in the minority community is often misconstrued. Yeah. Dianelli, I'm curious because you got your ear to the street. When it comes to these criminal justice issues, what, what do you hear from people? What, what are people's concerns around, around these questions? Because I'll be honest, when we've done like kind of like before elections, like polling or like kind of what you call voter ID in our business, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'll say this specifically about North Philly. I can't speak about Camden specifically, but North Philly, like in the Latino areas, like the police. The mistrust of police isn't their biggest issue. It's an issue with certain, you know, sectors. But, um, but I'm curious, Danelli, like, what what do you hear on the street as it relates to these issues that um, we should keep in mind? I think, especially me being Dominican, the main issue is like police arresting you so you could get deported. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a huge feeling like they don't want us here. This isn't really our country. It's like, no, we're here. <laughs> this, right. this is yeah. where we're from. This is this is it. Yeah. We deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And the thing is, Dominicans are a lot of Dominicans in our community are what we call another way of saying of another form of mixed families, because you'll have a Dominican, uh, you know, one partner's uh, legal resident, one partner's uh, undocumented. Their the other kids one's are a American citizen. citizen. They're the American other one has citizens. a visa. The the other other one has a, a working visa. visa. <laughs> one has a student visa. One has a. Uh, tourist visa and it's like <laughs> I don't know it's, we're trained out in 2012 but anyway <laughs> and it's so it's so tough even that like the whole immigration system like I remember when I was in Dominican Republic and my mom I didn't understand for the longest time why did my mom leave me when I was a little girl like I needed my mom and she had to come here and then go through the whole immigration process to bring us over here but it took years so even that is like it affects you it affects the family it and sure it's also does. like imagine like, I could only imagine having your father go to jail or your mother go to jail and just being without them for all those years. Like, it does. It really affects and is detrimental to the the fa the family and the fabric. I got a, I got a good friend who um, he's the youngest. Of, I don't know, six or seven. He's a Cibaño, too, Dominican guy. And he's the same thing. His family came here first and. He's the only he was the, he was the baby and he's the only one that was born in the States. Mm. And so there's all there's an interesting dynamic that he shared with me over the years because I don't want to say his siblings are jealous, but because of the dynamic, hey, you're the only one that had the papers, So it was kind of easier for you to, you know, get your education in the States mm -hmm. and all that. But also like basically like there was we were we were you were the only one that wasn't separated from your parents yeah. at any point mm -hmm. where the rest of us had to kind of, you know, there was one parent or so. These these stories are very real. Listen, and this this you know. immigration thing is it's it boggles my mind because the way that immigrants and I don't even like calling them Im folks that have come here to find a better future. That's mm -hmm. how I like to frame it. Mm -hmm. um, the way that they're being treated in this country right now was as if the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island and, you know, white folks coming from Europe, yeah. you know, to to America, even. We've you know, gone back like the Mayflower landing <laughs> like, on I the mean, eastern coast of of what was you know then just a piece of land now yeah, America just yeah. never happened. I think it's crazy to me. 
I think they're afraid we're going to do to this country what they did to this country. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, and it's, it's like, like snaps. no, <laughs> we're here to work. We're not trying to take, you know what I mean? We're trying to work and grow together. We're trying to live. No, you're right. Yeah. No, it's, um, but I think it goes back to the mass incarceration because we there, there's people in our society, even before this sort of rash of anti-immigrant stuff, there's people in our society, particularly the incarcerated, particularly black males, that we demonized yeah. and we mm-hmm. dis- we dehumanized. Mm-hmm. So if they can go to jail and they can be tortured in jail, or they can, you know, we can treat them like animals in jail, then we can treat other people like that, mm-hmm. and we can treat other people like that, and we can treat other people like that. And one of the things that um, it's just so sad to 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 have to remind people, yeah. and it shouldn't come to this because nobody should get treated this way. It doesn't matter. Is that if this can happen to these immigrants today or black males tomorrow, the next day it could be you. It could be anybody, any of us. We're all targets. Look, and I forget the young man's name, but there was, I think there's been two incidents recently on the border where U.S. citizen Latino kids, they've just scooped them up and yeah. they 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 had their college ID. They assumed. Well, mm-hmm. This young boy just got out of one of these facilities 23 days. You know, he's U.S. citizen. Yeah. He lost 26 pounds. Mm-hmm. Right. And they didn't let him take a shower for those 23 days. <gasps> I you don't see. treat. There are rules in the UN. I keep saying this on the show. <laughs> you cannot <laughs> treat criminals of war this way. So how are you going to treat people? They didn't they commit didn't a commit, violent yeah. act. Mm-hmm. They, at worst, they crossed the river. They weren't supposed to. That's the worst thing they did. Most of them are trying to are coming legally. Are trying to go through the legal process. But listen, even if even if they're coming illegally, because let's 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 talk about it plain. Yeah. Even if they're coming illegally, they're here physically. They often have family members here. They, they rarely are violent. They're rarely violent, and they're rarely unemployed. So what is the issue? I just posed that to you. No, it's That's a good it. question. <laughs> and it's interesting because... It's about power. Exactly. And it's and interesting control. because because the the you know you think about it from a party perspective, right? So the Republicans, you could argue, have been the bene- big beneficiaries of undocumented immigration because the business class are the ones that benefit the most from cheap labor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, while their base fights over this, the elites of their own party, like the current president, the people of Mar-a-Lago, the people that own the big agricultural sectors, the people that, you know, all these, you know, every, I mean, look, you're not, you're not, you're not eating a dinner at a high class place that ain't done by an immigrant. You know, like, I mean, it's not happening. So, like, we're all benefiting from it, all of us, on some level are benefiting from it. And 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 now we're, we decide because of a of, of political uh, opportunism that we're going to pick on them now and treat them this way. And the saddest thing is, and we've had these conversations on Facebook and then we're going to take our break because I want to get to gaslighting. Okay. Is that the, the people, you know, these political pundits are so clueless on TV sometimes because they're trying to figure out why is he doing this? To these people, why is he doing this? To people, he, so he's precisely doing this people. He wants to show these people. I will hurt these people for you to protect you. And look, my thing is, I'm not sure if that's not going to help them. Hmm. And because I don't see any any up, uh, his popularity with his people are growing. Mm-hmm. So that to me is the scariest thing. And again, to your point earlier, Kyle, let's just be honest about it. And I think the more we're straight up about it, and as Democrats and progressives, we try to hide and we try to trick these some of these white people or try to trick. And look, it's not all just white. There's minorities that are buying this stuff too. Is that, that we have to confront the issue and match it to the time that we're in? The judge that put Meek Mill back in jail is black. The cops that arrested that arrested him were black. So it's about just them brainwashing even our own people to to keep pushing their agenda. I'm really excited. When we come back, Dionelli's favorite segment, <laughs> gaslighting. Okay, coming right at you. So you're listening to WPPMLP 106.5 FM in Philadelphia. Hashtag People Powered Media. On the last segment of the show, we we have everyone's favorite segment, Gaslighting OK, where I break down if we are getting gaslighted or what. This is really interesting. Thank you so much for joining, particularly our IG and Facebook family um, and all of us watching. You know, these people watch this whole show every week, Kyle. It's really, I'm, I'm amazed. And they give us comments and we'll read them and. Um, and uh, we want to thank Jen, of course, for helping us make sure. Are we all still in the shot, Jen? 
We are doing good. Thank you so much for joining us. But in the last segment of the show, so this is what we do every week, brother, when, when Dionelli blessed her with her presence, Kyle. Mm-hmm. So she breaks down the concept of gaslighting very quickly. Dionelli, explain to the, the rookies out there that don't know about your brand. Explain to people very quickly what the concept of gaslighting. So gaslighting, I know a lot of people are probably living through it. I know a lot of prisoners are. I know a lot of people that are caught in the system are living through it, and they just don't know there's a word for it. I lived through it. Um, through a more like domestic violence situation. So gaslighting is an insidious form of persistent manipulation and brainwashing that causes the victim to doubt her or himself and ultimately lose her or his own sense of perception, identity, and self-worth. So gaslighting can occur in personal relationships at the workplace or over an entire society as we're seeing. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to listen to your, to your man, Meek Mill, Talk about his experience, and then Dionelli is going to share with us how that relates to the concept of gaslighting, okay? So let's listen to Meek and his recent appearance on The Breakfast Club. Down, too. This is a real issue, too, that nobody ain't really like addressed. each other. Uh, my judge was black. My PO was black. Uh, the DA was white. Uh, the cops that uh, arrested me was black. Like, I, I was on a speech, and I was just talking about uh, how one of the cops, he was like 33, I was like 19. He got up there and was dropping tears like he was like... You know what I'm saying? I asked the judge not to give you a lot of time if you apologize to me. She was like, this is on public record, too. Mm-hmm. The judge said, Mr. Williams, do you want to apologize to him for you get sentenced? My life is on the line. I'm, I could get 5 to 10 years, 10 to 20 years. No, I don't want to apologize to him because I didn't do it. My lawyer t- tapped me on my side and whispered in my ear saying, you better apologize right now. This could change your life right now. I was like, if you felt threatened... I apologize, but basically not apologizing for pointing no gun at you because I ain't. That's like an admission of guilt. Yeah, Yeah, hell yeah. You know, that's a powerful moment there. Absolutely. So that's something that gaslighters do is they try to make you believe a reality that doesn't exist. Mm. And they just keep repeating and repeating and repeating to one point you get like, well, maybe I did do something wrong. Maybe I am guilty. Mm. Maybe I do deserve to be treated this way. Mm. And something else that they do where he mentioned that the judge is black, the cops were black, like, Everybody, the main players that were putting him in that situation were all black. And you feel like, yo, this is supposed to be my support system. So that's a, something called triangulation when they put play people against you and then you against them. So in the end, you feel isolated. And like in the end, you just have to end up doing what they, they're telling you to do. We're going to get back to a little more of that meat clip. But Kyle, you know, we, we would be remiss if, if you'd be on the show. You know, tell us a little bit about the meat that you know. I mean, really quickly, because obviously... You're in a unique position to sort of work with him on this movement building. And uh, obviously, he's such an icon here in Philadelphia and, and around the hip-hop world. But just uh, any something that you think we should know about your experience working with Meek in this project. So, you know, and, in, 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 you know, I'm still developing relationships with, with him and his camp. Um, but he's one of the smartest men I've ever met. Interesting. Um, that, that's in the, the hip-hop space, and a lot of folks get a bad rep. Um, but what I can say is... is just the honesty piece. You know, he's very open uh, about what happened. Um, and he's, even in that, that clip, I mean, he took you through a, a process in his mm-hmm. mind. He's like, well, you know, I didn't I didn't do anything. Yeah. And I'm not going to compromise my truth and my reality to tell you that I did something. No, and the thing is, people yeah. don't real, a lot of people don't realize that my brother Mario Koyas was part of the, the, the Army of the Pharaohs crew and the hip-hop scene here in Philly for many years. He reminded me, he said, he said one of the most persistent people in the game because for people that really know, you know, that he basically had to be a troll for Rick Ross on Twitter for a year to get any attention. Um, and he started with T.I. and that history. But, I mean, a guy that um, when he focuses on something, he gets it done. No question. Yeah. Let's uh, let's hear a little more from me before we wrap this up. And that's how that worked, though. No, people don't understand. Like, we got parole. When you go in front of the parole board, even if they know you took a deal for a crime that you didn't do, you still have to admit to guilt. Mm before stepping out the walls like you got to go in front of three people in a room and just admit to you guilty to and you ain't even do it you just took a deal because but say Takashi case hold a life sentence he might t- end up taking a deal I don't know what he gonna do but he'll take a deal for 10 years he probably ain't even do it they got him listed for it that's just- hmm, powerful that that speaks Kyle to the to the system we have yeah. to change yeah I mean listen like the fact that a, a DA can corroborate with a lawyer and work something out in lieu of incarceration, you know, and give somebody 10 years of probation or, you know, a DA working with a with a judge and a lawyer to plea somebody out for a crime that they may or may not have committed 
and give them 10 years, which is a long time, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you're telling you're telling somebody that may or may not you could you could possibly get life. Mm -hmm. So, hey, mm -hmm. just do this 10 years real quick. Just I missed something you didn't nah, do. It's it's to your point. I mean, the system needs to be changed from within. And, uh, you know, we, we need to get those those folks out. The, and, the judges and what and needs the to change the, is that we need to lawyers. make this like a four hour breakfast club type show yes. because we got so much good yeah. stuff we didn't get to half of the things Dionelli some final comments please about gaslighting or anything you want to share with our audience so one thing about gaslighting is once you're aware the gaslighter loses a lot of their power so mm. we're in that phase where we're aware we're creating awareness we're spreading awareness and we have to don't, don't just focus so much on oh I gotta convince that person that has no idea about my community or anything like that. It's more about come together with the people that know, the people that understand, organize yourself, and keep talking about it. And then those other people are going to say, well, let me see what they're talking about, and they're going to try to understand. You know, to circle back to the my brothers and sisters, so I'm so proud of in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. no tengo miedo. That was a big part of the theme. It's like, we're not scared we're anymore. We're not scared. Kyle Darby, That's let people beautiful. know where they can keep up with you and with the Reform Alliance, brother. At King underscore Darb and uh, follow Reform at Reform uh, and visit ReformAlliance.com. Dionelli, where can people keep uh, keep this conversation about gaslighting and your personal development uh, uh, worldview here on, on Instagram? Where else on social media? Yes, yeah, so on Instagram and Facebook, Dionelli ETC. You could also follow the hashtag Surviving Gaslighting. And the next time we're going we're gonna to negotiate how we're going to get a Latino project and part of Reform Alliance because Edwin <laughs> Desimore, my brother from Philadelphia, yeah. is ready to collaborate with you guys. So awesome. we're going to keep doing that. Thank you all for joining the Found in Translation radio show and podcast. Peace.